Okay. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Umbraco Community Office Hours. Uh, my name is Matt Brailsford, and I'll be your host for today's topic, which is going to be all about the future of the Umbraco back office. Uh, here to help answer your questions is a, a lovely bunch of HQ members, and I, I don't think I'll offend anybody by attempting anybody's last name. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourselves uh, in person one by one. So Philip, do you want to start? Yes, I'd like you to pronounce my last name though, but it's good. Uh, my, yeah, I'm Philip Becky Varson, uh, and uh, I'm the, the program manager for CMS. So I kind of uh, have the overall uh, like strategic uh, responsibility for the open source project uh, that is in practice CMS. Um, but I'm actually, uh, my background is as a front end developer for many years. Uh, so uh, I guess that's more or less why I'm in this call as well, and why I'm I'm really passionate about uh, about back office. Back office is what brought me to Umbraco in the first place. So yeah, I think that's the that's the short description. Uh, I'll pass it on to Nils. Then you can explain. You can introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Nils Lykse, uh, but it's perfectly fine if you say long so or long so, <laughs> something along those lines. <laughs> I'm a UI and UX engineer. Adam Bracco, uh, and that's sort of a combination between a UI UX designer and a front end developer, which also explains my background as, uh, yeah, a developer, backup, <laughs> front end developer, and uh, as well a designer. Um, but my main purpose to be here is actually to make sure that we uh, continue to improve uh, for our contributors, um, keep a friendly back office simple, light, easy to use, intuitive, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, that already is somehow in the code. Nice. Yeah. Uh, oh, yep. sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, Matt, you can ask a question. Uh, Matt's up next, yeah? Oh, OK, good. Yeah, cool, I can go next. Uh, so my name is Mass. I'm also a front-end developer. Uh, and um, I guess my uh, my main uh, focus right now is is this future proofing uh, the back office project, and um, especially on uh, on the part with the with the new extension API, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, later. And uh, but then I also have a task helping out uh, some of the other teams uh, at HQ, uh, so helping with UI UX for for the cloud uh, the cloud team, and and we also help of course uh, bug fixing and features for for the CMS. Uh, uh, version eight and and for deploy and forms if, 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 if any needed help. Uh, yeah, that's me. And that brings us to Julia. Uh, so my name is Julia Grostrinska, but you can just call me Julia. It's way easier. Uh, I'm a student programmer in the front end team, so I'm on my way to become a front end developer, I guess. Um, and I started in January. Uh, with an internship and uh, now I'm hanging around building UI uh, library components. Excellent. Cool. Well, we've got a few questions that we're going to go through today that we've got pre-prepped. Uh, but if anybody is watching live and they've got questions that they want to ask, then if you can use the Q&A feature of Zoom, uh, so there should be a little button at the bottom, but if you can use that, Q and A feature, we'll we'll try and get those answered as well. Uh, but I guess a good place to start with this session, then, maybe for anybody that's not quite as familiar what all this front end kind of a uh, rebuild is about, is maybe just if we can get a bit of a background as to what got us to this point, and then what we're what are we actually talking about when we're saying future uh, future proofing of of the back office. So uh, maybe you want to take this one, Philip. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so so back office is uh, just so everybody's along. Like back office is the, the part where the editor logs in and uh, changes content, uh, and uh, and where developers you know, design models and, uh, and does stuff. I guess uh, so. Uh, so it's it is a little bit uh, confusing sometimes because a lot of the time when we talk about front end of a website, we we talk about 
uh, the, the actual website that, that is built on top of Embraco. But when we talk about front end at HQ, it's it's about back office. So like the the application that the editors use. So that's that's just to to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, so uh, back office has been through uh, a number of uh, of iterations. I was looking uh, through uh, a, a very old slide slide deck a couple of uh, uh, of hours ago because I'm preparing for code garden as well, uh, and uh, and found some of the the first uh, drawings of uh, of the back office for version one and for for version four and uh, the the v seven one, which was probably the the biggest change, uh, where it went from being a, a more or less a classical uh, .NET, uh, you know, server rendered uh, web app uh, to or to becoming a real uh, web app like a single page app with routing in the client and uh, like a like a modern uh, application. Yeah. Uh, but in V7, it there was still a lot of stuff that was still you know more or less the, the server uh, doing its thing, and then we just displayed it in an iframe or something uh, uh, in the back office. Uh, so V8 was uh, was the first. Uh, the first real uh, single page app where everything was JavaScript, uh, I guess, was was uh, was the was the catchphrase uh, of V8. Uh, so, and I mean, that, it, that really paved the way for for us to then do the .NET Core upgrade without breaking the back office. Uh, so that the actually decoupling the back office from uh, the back end uh, was really really important to us uh, and continues to be uh, and. Um, uh, yeah, so now I got off on a tangent. So that's uh, <laughs> uh, so that's that's the back office, and, and lots of stuff has happened. But now uh, uh, people have been asking us for the last couple of years, uh, like when are we, uh, you know, upgrading Angular, or uh, when are we doing something about that, uh, or what, what's the next back office going to be like? And, uh, and we we've, we've had a you know we've had a hard time figuring out like what do we do with this? What's the right approach to this? Uh, so in uh, December. We put out an RFC, uh, so a request for comments, where uh, to the community, where we kind of like described uh, what's the what's the plan for the next back office, and in in, in a very short uh, uh, you know, amount of words, the, the whole idea is that we we kind of see that back office has three layers, and instead of trying to fix all at once, we'll try to fix one layer at a time, uh, and the top layer that has some issues is around the UI. Uh, and as uh, as Julia and Nils all, all already uh, uh, you know uh, uh, spoiled for me, uh, they uh, uh, were building a UI library uh, to take care of that, uh, so that uh, you can have all the uh, the Braco look and feel uh, if if you're in back office, but also if you're in a third party application, if you're like in the Braco cloud portal or anywhere else that's not in the back office. And you can rely on that also if you're doing packages and stuff. You don't you don't have to rely on copying all the right class names and and stuff to to have make something that looks like Embraco. So that's the first part. Then the second part, as uh, as Mass was uh, saying, is about defining the the extension API because we realized that the API that we have today is is uh, is pretty great, but it's pretty limited, and that may, that means that everybody has just been uh, more or less taking a hack at uh, at what they can, what they could, and we've been encouraging, so we're not blaming anybody. Uh, so, uh, but we want to get the API to a better place uh, where it's not too top, too tightly coupled to any specific framework, and where it's easier to test, and uh, you know, it supports modern coding today. So your better IDE help and stuff like we want to bring the back office API to a better place as well. And then there's the last last, last part, which is about actually you know, re-implementing all of back office to, that's where we get rid of AngularJS and we pick a new framework or no framework or, or how we, I'm sure we'll go into that discussion later. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the, that's, those are the three parts and that's kind of where we're at now. We started the, the UI library with maybe about halfway there uh, with the components that we've you know, said this is going to be the 1.0 of the UI library. Uh, and then uh, Mass is working on the API. And I don't know, it probably can't put a percentage on how, how that's going, but uh, it's uh, it's going well. We've, we've had lots of talks internally and with uh, partners and MVPs and community people and stuff. So yeah, lots of good stuff happening. So that was the short. I'm sorry, I can't give a short answer to anything. <laughs> how is there a short answer to the history of the Umbrella yeah. back office? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well. I, th I think it's pretty obvious from that anyway that the back office is is something pretty fundamental to to Umbraco itself, and so any any thought of 
kind of re redeveloping that or rebuilding that is 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 no mean feat and it's anybody in the community is going to want to make sure that whatever we do we try and do it the right way um so it could be uh could you tell us some of the things that hq are doing then uh, and some of the initiatives that have been put in place to ensure that we do get this kind of right and do it the right way sure anybody want to take a yeah. stab at it or do you want me to <laughs> <laughs> it's a quite broad question so yeah <laughs> well as i mean i mentioned already that we're, we're we did an rfc already uh, we did one for the entire uh, process and then we want to do one for each of the the main parts so we we had one out also for the ui library uh, and just to reiterate like rfc's are request for comments where we describe how we intend to do something and then let community people and other people who are interested uh, chime in with their experience with their comments with what you know seeing where there where there's uh, where there's something we're missing or, or something like that and, and and getting a chance to to you know have an influence on on how stuff is done before we actually start doing anything uh, so that's uh, that's the first way and then you know we we're starting a community team uh, around this as well um and I think Mass might be able to to speak to that a little more and about what they're doing. But the 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 point is that we we're doing we're taking people from the community that uh, has shown a, a particular interest uh, in in being part of this and drawing them in a little bit closer and using them to kind of bump ideas up against and uh, and see what makes sense and maybe have them try out uh, stuff while it's still in a prototype or something like that. Sorry, I'm, now I'm spoiling your, your story, Ness, but you want to say more yeah, about the well, community team? <laughs> I think you did it. You did it pretty well. <laughs> Where are we with the community team? Yeah, I can tell that. So we are, we are very, very close to be able to announce uh, the community team. We are only missing the final details. Uh, so hopefully during next week uh, or something like that, we will be able to, to announce the, uh, the full uh, community team. And as, uh, as Philip uh, said, it will be a team where we can share ideas and get feedback uh, on the prototypes for, for the future back office. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to be able to do that. I think as somebody that's been around in the Mbako community for a while um, and known how past back offices have probably been built, I think it's quite interesting in that you we have uh, that we are seeing these teams develop. So I think this is probably the first time that there's really been a dedicated UI team at HQ. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I guess you're all part of that team, but maybe you want to expand <laughs> on, <laughs> on what that team kind of is and what their responsibilities are a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I, I can do that. Uh, so it's the people uh, you see here, uh, me, Julia, and Nils, and then we have... Uh, we have Philip as our honored uh, member of the front <laughs> of the front end team. Um, but uh, as I said in my introduction, um, right now the front end team's main focus is uh, is on future proofing uh, the back office. It's a it's a huge project, and and we spend uh, a lot of time uh, on that. Uh, but on the side, uh, we also uh, have a, a, a current version of the CMS uh, which might need uh, some new features, and we know need bug fixes uh, once in a while. So we will help uh, during bug fixes. We will help do uh, PR reviews uh, from the community, which also do a lot of bug fixes for the CMS. Then we have a cloud portal, uh, which uh, also need features. And if uh, they're all great teams in themselves, but sometimes they need a, a little bit help with the UI or UX or, or just the development of the front end. Uh, and then uh, they can bring in uh, some of us uh, from the front end team and, uh, and we can help out. So that's uh, that's how the front end team works. A little bit everywhere, but right now with the main focus uh, on future proofing the back ops. Yeah, maybe so to put it in perspective a little. Uh, six months ago, the front end team was just Nils. Uh, so and Nils still had to help Cloud and still had to do all <laughs> of that. So even if even uh, even that we are focusing a lot on the new future proofing, uh, we're still we still managed to actually have more. Uh, time to help with the cloud features uh, and to uh, and I think probably more or less the same amount of uh, hours goes into V8 as uh, as six months ago uh, because now it's just divided between uh, a couple more people 
so like it's like it's not like AB8 will, will just be still and nothing will happen to it. I think uh, in in the eight. 14 release that's uh, where there's the RC next week and it's scheduled for the beginning of June. We have a, a nice uh, new media picker coming and that's very much a front end project that Nils has been working on for a while and uh, it's really nice to finally see. So it's like it's not like V8 is is, is just stalling, uh, but it's it's nice that we actually have the capacity now to do more on, on a future back office. Cool. Um... So one of the things that I'm quite interested in and excited about with the new UI is this idea of um, Umbraco as a framework. So you've, you've kind of touched on that a little bit in the RFC um, where we're looking at componentizing things and having a components library. So can you tell us uh, what we can expect from the, com from the components library and also what other considerations are being made around the idea of on Braco as a framework itself. So uh, I guess what you can expect is at the end you can expect a set of uh, set of components, reactive components that will not only be used to to build the future back office, but can also be used by developers and package developers, and that will uh, that will ensure that all of it looks like Umbraco and is consistent uh, with each other and that uh, uh, package developers or anyone who works with Umbraco won't have to care about styling them and uh, the whole presentation logic. The only thing you will have to care about is whatever is, uh... <laughs> sorry, I got lost, but whatever is, uh, whatever you need to do, but you will, you won't have to care about updating the properties. They will just update themselves. Yeah, also for accessibility, I think it's really nice yeah. that all the work that uh, the community team and that people at HQ are putting into accessibility no longer only applies to the back office, but are also applies to packages and applies to the portal and to everywhere else the UI library is used. And, and maybe one one great thing that maybe mostly touches uh, the current experience is that by us separating the UI into a separate project, we ensure that there will and cannot exist business logic in it. So it will be much sharper on the responsibility of the parts for the UI versus the products, um, which will make it much easier to develop UI uh, in Umbraco regime. Cool. Um, so, going back to the RFC and the components library then, uh, you've made the choice for these to be built as web components. So can you tell us what led to the choice uh, over basing them on some kind of framework? And do you have any examples of how these will work in the actual Umbraco back, uh, back office UI? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I mean, I think web components is a is a really nice uh, fit uh, for a UI library because it uh, it will work with any framework uh, because it is basically just components like a div element or a span element or a button element or anything that you know already from the DOM. Uh, from a framework perspective, uh, all these all the UI components will work the same. Uh, so that means that the frameworks, they all know how to, you know, put text in a button or to, uh, you know, a attach a, an event listener to uh, to something. And all of that will just work with the UI library, no matter what framework you're using. So I think that's a really nice fit. Uh, and then I think it, it also uh, makes uh, the, the components themselves uh, very lightweight. Uh, so that if you want to just use the Umbraco button, you don't have to... Uh, pay for a, a 200 kilobyte framework to uh, to download just to get the button. Uh, and that's that's also one of the things that we, we really wanted to enable that use case where, where you can just say, yeah, I, I want just this part uh, and uh, and I want to use it on my totally unrelated uh, web app. I think that's, that's pretty cool. 
Uh, and I mean, then uh, I think what we've also seen with the with the current thing with Angular, Angular, and our Angular JS is that like time runs out of uh, for 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 frameworks. Uh, they will eventually eventually be deprecated, and people will stop caring about them or stop thinking that they're nice. Uh, and but web components are a web standard, which means that uh, all the APIs, all the way you deal with it, uh, is something that lives in the browser and never is deprecated. Uh, and it, like the way that the um, that frameworks or anything will use the web components are the same. No matter uh, it doesn't matter how we build the web components. So we've chosen a little uh, helper that's called Lit to build the UI library components with. Uh, but when that becomes out of fashion, we can we can use something else and all the components will still be the same for the for any consumer of them i think that's a that's a really valid point as well yeah and i mean as for how you use them uh nils you you showed off something uh, once where you tried to, to take some of the new components and put them in the existing back office could you talk maybe just yeah. uh a little bit about that. I don't know if you have it yeah, to, to show or if you just want to talk uh, about it. I don't have it ready for show, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but but I can talk a little bit about it and try to des describe how it is. So since it's uh, web components, basically just is, is uh, HTML components, you just write, you know, like putting in a button, you write the, the what's it called, square, no, arrow brackets, whatever. Angle brackets. Angle brackets, thank you. Um, and, uh, and then you can put in a component like that and it, that works as well in AngularJS in the existing backup. So we already tried out to put in uh, the text field from our uh, future UI library into the current back office and hook it up with uh, values coming from AngularJS, basically just writing the, the, the attribute, passing in the, the, the value. Um, uh, and that just works out of the box. The, the only thing we don't have is AngularJS has the ability to double bind. So it can use properties or attributes to pass back values. We don't do that, but instead we have to hook up uh, through events to do such thing. But that's a relatively simple thing. So actually we can or could uh, implement uh, the UI library in existing back office or in any other project I would. Is that just an experiment, or do you think that might be a plan <laughs> if we're if we're keeping going with V eight for a while? Yeah, and even I mean the the, the back office is the same for V nine, uh, and will probably be the same for V ten. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, we we might we might start doing that. Uh, we we prob we'll probably want to use it in other projects first to kind of, to not use Umbraco as the guinea pig. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but absolutely that, that it, it might even be a nice way for ourselves to learn more about how it is to actually use the components uh, and for package developers to start learning uh, how you use them in whatever back office is today. So that once they get to migrate to the new back office, uh, um, it'll be easier and more familiar because all of the UI components, they already know how to use. So I would say it, it would be a, like we, we don't have any specific plans, but I, I would definitely say that it makes sense. Nice. Um, so web components fits really nicely into that UI uh, component library quite well, but how will you, we start to use those elements, I guess, in the back office? And at this point, we end up talking about frameworks and, and those types of things. And, and we all know that developers get pretty passionate about their framework choices and uh, tech stacks that they want to use. So is there any clues at the moment as to what frameworks we might be looking at? Or do you have anything that you've been experimenting with and trying out? We don't have any. Uh, we don't have any decisions yet. Uh, so we're, we like we designed the process uh, this way because we want to make sure that we do all of the defining the extension API before we pick a framework, so yeah. that we make sure that those are decoupled from each other. Um, but I mean, we see in the community and at HQ uh, that uh, there's a lot of love for for different frameworks. Uh, a lot of people like Vue. A lot of people like React, uh, and I mean, of course, we'll, we'll look into uh, to all of those and figure out uh, 
whether those are the, the, the best fit. Uh, yeah, so yeah, and we don't really have anything to, to say about that yet. But the, the, the main thing to note that in this new way of doing it, whatever framework back office uses doesn't really matter uh, for you as a package developer and of, uh, not at all if you're an editor, but uh, if, if you're a developer or a package developer, it doesn't really matter to you uh, what framework back office uses because uh, you, you use the API that doesn't depend on any framework. And if you want to build a property editor, you should be free to use Vue or React or whatever you want to for that. Uh, and you like, we shouldn't limit you to only use one. And today, I mean, Today you can use uh, you can do it through Angular JS, but it's a little convoluted. But there are examples of packages uh, more or less building their own stuff with Vue, or I think WooCommerce does it with Vue, or yeah. all of it more or less as one app, uh, and that's that's fine. Uh, but today it's 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 a little too convoluted to make that happen uh, because it's the API is pretty tied to Angular JS, and you need Angular JS services to do open something and all of that stuff. And we want to make sure that you don't have that tight coupling. So the framework choice of back office should really be for contributors uh, to, to the back office and for people at HQ. Okay. I think when, when we comes a little longer in the, uh, in the uh, API uh, project and we start looking at how you, how you will be able to build uh, property editors and, and we will see the API for that. We will also experiment with different examples so we can see uh, how would a property editor look if we build it with Vue or with React or with Angular. Um, so we have something to compare and also to show that you can actually, you can use the new API or will be able to use the new API with any framework. Uh, and, and I think that would be cool to, to actually experiment with that. Yeah. Yeah, we've been, so to like, we've been toying a little bit. So none of what I'm gonna say now is something that's a decision or uh, like, one of the prototypes that we're looking at is where a property editor is also just a web component uh, because any, th any framework can build a web component uh, and since like whatever framework we choose can interact with that web component. So that's a nice, you know, frameworkless API to, to work with uh, and how you set a value of it and, and read it back. And that's, that's kind of easy. And that's, we already do that with a native input field or something like that. So it might be a good case. Again, this is not something we've decided. It's just something we're playing a lot, playing, playing with. Uh, but with that, uh, I mean, I've built a property editor that's then, you know, made with React and works with whatever framework we, we use uh, to, to, to do the prototype. And that's, uh, that, well, that works and that's really nice. And I assume you'll be doing RFC process and things anyway before any commitment to any particular framework in the back office. Because I guess what, whilst, sorry, whilst people are probably going to be able to use their own, I, I guess a lot of developers would want to use whatever Umbraco is natively written in. Yeah. So we, we're we using uh, this uh, framework called Lit for the UI library and uh, we kind of like how that feels. And uh, if the API turns out to be web components for, for like property editors and dashboards and stuff, if that's the way we go, uh, I could see us uh, probably, you know, advising people to use something like that. Uh, and uh, I mean, we probably have some kind of API work to find out as well, like uh, how do we, can we share a framework or something like that? So everybody, every framework doesn't come with its own React. So, or every property editor doesn't come with its own React, but maybe you can share one. Or, like we don't know yet, but that's a, that's a concern with that approach. Yeah. It's one I've thought of as well in terms of if, if everybody implements their own or uses their own framework in their own implementations, it's, it's trying to avoid that blur, isn't it? But okay. I mean, if, if, to just to touch on the process, as you said, uh, with RFCs for the next parts. Uh, so, whereas for the UI library, we did an RFC first, and then we built the UI library. Uh, for the API part, it's the other way around because it's an exploration project. So, Mass uh, is talking to uh, lots of people in the community and uh, gold partners and MVPs and people everywhere looking at different use cases. And eventually, with, between him and the community team, he will come up with a proposal of, uh, and, and the rest of the team here, of course, uh, come up with a proposal for how do we think the API should look like? And that will then be come out as an RFC so everybody can come in and we can have all of that out in the open. And then when we get to actually 
the third part of re-implementing back office. We're probably going to do some kind of RFC on that as well. Uh, but since, uh, as we're saying, that, that part is mostly, you know, relevant for people that would actually be contributing to back office, either working at HQ or, or uh, uh, you know, as part of the open source project, uh, it, it, I don't think that will be too, you know, busy of an RFC because uh, that that's, pro that's today that's not too many people. Cool. Uh, going beyond just functionality then, uh, and if we think from a, a design perspective, when we're looking at the redoing the new UI, do we think we'll be looking at any design changes? Or are we looking for potentially a direct port of what the current UI is? And will there be any changes to the extension points that we, we think think will be available. I think you said earlier that AngularJS is pretty easy to abuse <laughs> and hook into a lot of things. So I think it'll be quite tricky getting everything, but do you have a plan for that? Um, and yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's two questions there. Maybe you can answer the UI part and then Matt yeah. can answer the API part. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, well, I also thought maybe a little bit on extension points, but but will there be a change of UI style to answer that question? Yes and no. Basically, no. We'll continue with the simple and friendly design we know from today. It's already uh, evolved and, and uh, it's called corrected quite a bit in V8 um, to be aligned. But what will happen with the UI components is now that we start putting them into system and get the overview of them, we can see that some of them doesn't use the right spacing or the right colors in the right way. But now that we are componentizing everything, those things will be corrected. So if you have a CRI, you will see a difference, uh, but most users probably won't notice a difference. Um, so will there be a change in extension points available? That's maybe a double question because that's <laughs> part for mess. But in terms of UI, uh, uh, yes, uh, because the overall um, the purpose and responsibility of the UI components will be redefined. Today, the UI components both serve a visual purpose, but often also a business logic purpose. And we'll get that away. The business logic will be out. Now we're just serving a interaction and visual purpose. Um, so all the business logic is out. Implementers have to decide what a component does or how it, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what it does basically. Um, but we also want to make sure that we don't have um, uh, complex components trying to solve multiple purposes. A component has to solve one purpose um, and that responsibility is, uh, is uh, sort of being redefined to, to, so you can have a component and make sure it's for that purpose. Um, so what am I going to, trying to say with that? I'm trying to say that, that we'll make components that, that serves a scoped purpose, and then there will be extension points for a component. So an example could be a, uh, a media item card that we know from the existing backups today. You have one in the UI, uh, in the media library, you have one in, in the media picker, for example. That's a card displaying a media item from the library. Um, but the current one we have today also holds a remove button and an edit button and Etc. 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 Features that are not really related to the purpose of the component, but related to the context where it's being used. So instead of having a remove button and an edit button baked into a media item card, we will just make sure that the media item card displays a media item, and then there will be slots to inject the actions or uh, put a tag on it, and so on. So so the one implementing a media card can can do what they need for that context. Yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to say. But but, but yeah, in general, uh, the UI library will be like an atomic, follow the atomic design principles. So we'll have even smaller UI components that you can use to build your own lab UI. Um, so, so the need to build and customize parts as of today should be less necessary, hopefully not necessary in the future. So you as a package developer will just pull down the parts that you need and put them together. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and then I guess, Mess, I don't know if you have anything to say about extension maybe, points. Maybe yeah. before that, uh, mention that uh, the UI library uh, works with uh, CSS custom properties as the kind of API for styling. 
uh, which means that uh, back office is going to be way more uh, like themable than it is today. Uh, so if as an agency you wanted to make a custom theme for for back offices for your customers or whatever, uh, you would be able to just uh, set a, a lot of top level CSS variables and that will flow through everything. And now also because if package authors use the same UI library, it's also going to affect packages and everything. Uh, and I mean, in our examples and in the UI library, like we've we've been toying with the uh, like supporting dark mode or something like that, just more or less to to kind of uh, make sure that we actually used all the variables everywhere. Uh, but I mean, it's it's pretty nice that we now now also have that uh, flexibility uh, for 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 UI. The intention is to enable like high contrast mode. Yeah, high contrast. Well. Mode. Um, and I I just noticed in the Q and A, and I don't know if we're answering those questions yet. Matt, um, but there's uh, one asking whether the UI library will be based on JSON design tokens. And we haven't decided such yet, but it's definitely uh, a possibility that will go that direction. We will have uh, like color variables, sizing variables and so on. Um, so why not put them into JSON so they can be used by JavaScript as well. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about what's the, like, what's the business of the UI library and what's the business of the using the UI library in the back office and like JSON design tokens might be somewhere in between and we need to figure out do we ship it as part of one or part of the other or how does that work but you know having all of that available uh, through JavaScript as Neil says it is makes sense. I guess answering uh, linked to that question before we go to Mads about the API extension points is the design perspective as well. So there's a QA question in there. So although we're going to be basing much of the new UI off of what's there currently, um, will there be dedicated design people, so, uh, um, team members at HQ that if we are creating new components, do we have people from a design perspective to make sure they're on, on brand, look nice, accessible, all those types of things. I, I guess think that's what Nils is. Races on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, it's subjective if you think it uh, looks uh, beautiful today, but uh, I've tried to do my best within the limits of V8, but of course, a new UI library will enable us to improve even further. Um, as we are quite limited today. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll get onto that <laughs> later. So Matt, do you want to talk about what are the potential extension points from an API perspective? Yeah. Um, so you can say that uh, the extension API is, is uh, uh, in the JavaScript world a little bit uh, interesting. Um, so we kind of we kind of have two. Uh, there's the official uh, APIs that uh, or extension points that you find on our. And, uh, and we, uh, of course, want to cover all of that. So you can, you can do the same things. Uh, you can make property editors and you can make dashboards and all of that uh, should still be possible uh, with the new API. And then we have the, uh, uh, the more, uh, uh, what should we call it, a back office API, uh, the JavaScript API. And this is, the, this is the part where we need to figure out uh, how much uh, should be available in, in the new version. And, and then we have all the Unofficial API, which you can do with the with Angular JS, uh, which are the interceptors and the decorators and and all of that, and that's why part of this exploration uh, phase we have uh, uh, we have talked to uh, to different uh, developers and agencies um, and made them uh, show us some of their hacks, and we also made a discussion board. Uh, it's a, a little bit quiet in there uh, right now, so I hope that someone will be able to, to share some of their hacks in there at some point. But that will actually allow us to see what is needed out in the, call it the real world, uh, some of the examples where we are missing some really good uh, extension APIs um, and where you do those, uh, those hacks where you think uh, this is really cool, but I'm not really sure if this will break in, uh, with an update. And we want to cover uh, the ones that we think uh, make most sense. Um, we can't promise anything, but uh, but but if something is, is obvious that this should, uh, of course, be extendable, then uh, then we will look into it. Yeah, I mean, we know that the reason why 
a lot of developers lo love back office and love Embraco is because like it's very flexible and you can bend it to pretty much do anything you'd like. And uh, even if we are gonna make it a little more limited, and we probably will, uh, it like we still want to have it to be very very flexible. Uh, but it is it, it is gonna be. Uh, I, I mean, it's not. It's not. It's going to be less a uh, cowboy uh, than it is today. Uh, so we can have uh, you know safe upgrades, uh, and uh, you don't have to worry about it when you click the upgrade button in cloud or, or something like that. Uh, you don't have to worry about your your packages breaking or, or, or something like that. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's that. I mean, that's that's really what Mass is working on as well. Is like coming up with. How would that work? How how do we allow people to put anything anywhere or change anything to anything else uh, <laughs> without making it, you know, just a big soup of uh, spaghetti, right? Yeah, I know I've uh, abused those APIs in the past. <laughs> <laughs> And made beautiful things with them. And I mean, yeah. that's, that's really the point. Like people are not doing it to be evil and we, we haven't told them not to. Uh, so it's like, I mean, yeah, we need to make sure that you're, you're still able to, to do uh, beautiful stuff. Uh, it should even be easier. I think it's the difference, I guess, between just allowing anything and having no control over that versus putting some standards in place. And I think one of the things in V7, V8 is uh, a phrase that gets used, which is non-breaking, breaking changes, which is usually around the CSS uh, side of things, which I guess because we've not had that ability to like have a, an overall view of everything that is the Umbraco UI, it's been very difficult to keep control of that. And then any CSS changes will inv invariably potentially break other packages that might be using those same CSS classes. Um, and because of that difficulty at, at HQ, it's always been taken that style changes are not breaking changes. So what are we looking at now? Will the components library and taking control of all this thing, uh, these things, these extension points, will those help keep those to a minimum? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with all your points, uh, Matt. It's it's the current style architecture is making it so hard for us to evolve and, and change. Um, and, and we even have a hard time figuring out just how things are connected in our own parts, but including packages that we don't even we don't even have the code for all the packages out there. So, so we have no no idea how things are used. But generally the the the, the hopefully having the UI library with components serving a certain purpose will help out as we know sort of what they are here to use to, to, to achieve. Um, currently we have classes that does many general things and can be used in Eastern and West and everywhere. Um, so, but uh, the, the components and the choice of using web components also uh, enables us to use Shadow DOM for our web components and we're doing so with the UI library. So all the styles that are styling or the style that is styling, <laughs> each component is, is then is styled by its own styles. How, how do I even say that? The they are code, code. <laughs> the code that styles a component is owned by the component and is not floating out or styling anything else. It's encapsulated or scoped as Julia just, uh, just mentioned. So, so things won't affect each other. Um, and hopefully by using these atomic design principles, um, we can um, we will have these very small UI components and through those, the combination of those, you'll be able to make uh, the UI that fits um, your needs. Um, yeah, so there won't be yeah. a button class that you put on a button to make it look like a button. Uh, there's just going to be a UI button yep. uh, element that you put in whenever you want a button. And then we take care of styling that and making sure it works. And it, like, if there's a change to it, we make sure to update that. So you don't have to, so you like with the new, when the new back office eventually gets here, you, you, there are no classes to use uh, because everything's encapsulated in elements and you can only use the elements. And another thing is because we are thinking more purpose than look in terms of our code and naming, 
then for example the button you know today it can be green or red depending on the the symbolic uh, purpose of it um, that's not named green or red that's named uh, so, so what we do currently is that the ui button takes a look that can be either positive or a warning or a danger um, so it's not specific to the color meaning that we could actually evolve the color or even the look of a button to serve that purpose and that general approach uh, we're trying to apply on all components. Cool. I think a very relevant question has just been asked in the QA as well, which stems back to how the UI might have been overly abused before, which is probably lack of documentation. So will all these new components be well documented? Any new uh, API extension points. Uh, what's the documentation process on those? Are they are they being done as they go along, sort of thing? So for the UI library, uh, we're ship we're building it in a, a, like a documentation platform or playground or what you want to call it. Uh, that's called Storybook, uh, which like works as like you could almost most say it works like a like a style guide. But uh, I'm not going to use that word because that has different meaning to different people uh, but the point is that in there you get to play like there's actually like a like an like a interactive playground where you can play along with like what what do the up what options do i have and how does the button change its look if i give it another another look or or, or yeah so you can you can play along with it and uh, and the nice thing is that all of that is automatically generated from the source code and comments within the source code so there will be no more uh, you know decoupling between the documentation, uh, the, the yeah, all, all the information about a component and the actual implementation. There's no, there's no decoupling there because we don't think that's like, we, we want that to be from the same thing. So like there's a little script that reads through the TypeScript code and actually figures out uh, what what part of this component is a, is a public API thing and automatically generates a documentation based on that. And that that works out really well. And then we're able to add comments to it if we want to, if we want to describe something more. And, and that's probably something we will continue to work on and where the community will, will pitch in, I'm sure, uh, when they find stuff that's not you know, described enough. Uh, but it's really nice that it comes out of the box uh, with, with the UI library, uh, yeah. Maybe also have to mention that the UI library we are building right now is uh, written in TypeScript which enables the, uh, your code editor or your IDE to, to know about the attributes, properties, and events that a component takes in. So the need for documentation should also hopefully be less uh, as you in your uh, code editor can see and understand how you use an element. Yeah, so when you, in your template, write your UI button, and you start write, writing an attribute and you start writing L, then it's automatically going to suggest to you uh, look, even though that's not an HTML attribute that's standardized anywhere. It's something that's from our, uh, that's from the UI library. And when you press that, it's going to auto suggest all the possible uh, the looks that, that, that we ship with. Uh, so you can choose whether you want the positive or the warning or, or, or whatever you want. So all of that comes like built in. And that's, that's the tooling that we want to enable uh, as well. And I mean, there's been a community project to add something like that uh, to the existing back office in, or like to the AngularJS stuff today. And that is great. It makes it a lot better. But today that's decoupled, which means that when we, as we evolve back office, uh, that has to be manually kept up to date. And that's just a process that will eventually, like it doesn't scale very well. So we want to make sure that that's tied together uh, from now on so that the, that tooling will always be up to date with the source. And, uh, and just to make it clear, TypeScript is for uh, developing the, the components. You can use them uh, with any uh, way you want to write your code. So with any framework, as I said, but also if you want to just write, use them in plain JavaScript, you're free to do that. There's no requirement for you to use TypeScript, and there won't be. I guess documentation leads into one of the other questions we've got as well around what kind of support will there be in the future, do we think, for potentially package developers or agencies? Any any change in the UI is obviously going to be quite a big fundamental thing. So anybody that's built anything on top of 
the Umbraco back office is going to have quite a big job in terms of upgrading that. So do we know what might be available for support? <laughs> I'm guessing yeah. things like the videos that Warren's been doing, maybe. Yeah. Any... yeah so, so yeah, I'm sure uh, as for like the, the, the formal stuff from Umbraco HQ, uh, the, there's a training course about uh, extending the back office, which will of course be updated and and people who buy it within some kind of period will have all, you know free upgrade bridge courses or whatever. Uh, and uh, but I think like uh, a lot of it, a lot of this will come when we when we get closer to an actual release. I'm sure we'll do something, and and Warren will uh, with his videos uh, when the UI library is close to release. We expect that to be late summer or something like that. So that's not very far away. Uh, and we'll start, you know, using it in our own packages, and we're gonna do all of that. But when the new back office comes, that's really where all the pa all package authors uh, uh, have to learn something new and have to adopt. And that is gonna be a big thing. That that's no secret. It is gonna be a big change, especially for uh, for all the Matt Brailsford out folks out there that has you know big beautiful packages that are really well integrated and stuff that has put a lot of energy into that. Uh, I mean, that is that is gonna be a lot of work that 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 you have to redo. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, th that we, we as, as we're doing with the .NET Core migration right now, we will of course uh, reach out and help as much as we can and document and do webinars and do uh, all of the community work that we're doing right now for the .NET Core migration. I'm sure we'll do something similar, uh, but since this is not gonna happen for the next 12, 18, 24 months at least, uh, it's, I mean, yeah, it's premature to, to talk about uh, like specifics yet, I would say. But just know that we will be there to hold your hand. Good. You kind of hinted a little bit there in terms of date wise. Obviously, people are, are instantly going to be asking when. So, do we have an idea of potential? Yeah, as I said, for the UI library, uh, we're looking at uh, late summer, maybe around the time of the Unicore release. So late August, it might be September. Like it depends on lots of stuff. Uh, uh, also about what else uh, uh, the front end team needs to do for for other Umbraco properties, right? Uh, but uh, something like that. Q three is probably a good guess for for uh, for UI library release. Uh, as for new back office, it's very hard to say. Uh, I mean. I hope Kim uh, hears this, but of course we want to add more people to the team. Uh, but uh, we also need a budget for that, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, we don't have any, you know, particular plan for that. I would say my best guess right now, if you ask me, and don't, you know, pin me to this, but uh, maybe Umbraco Eleven, which is scheduled for uh, September twenty-two, maybe that, or for twelve, which will which will be March twenty-three. Uh, those would be my best guesses as of now, uh, but uh, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, it's a it's an impossible task to uh, to give anything uh, uh, very precise at this time. But hopefully, in three four months, when we have a plan of where back office will go and what framework we will use and all of that stuff, I think we'll be able to do a, a better plan and we'll be transparent about it as soon as we can. Uh, and I'm, that's what I'm doing now. I'm being as transparent as I can because we don't know anything yet more. Uh, but at that time, I hope that we're able to say by Obraco 11 or something like that, we'll, we'll have it there. Will you be trying to align that potentially with the long-term support um, numbering or versions? Yeah, so we're most likely going to... Uh, we'll make sure that it's not an LTS, uh, so that if you choose the LTS, you get something that is uh, solid and that that is well-tested and is it's not new. Uh, so uh, 10 is going to be the first LTS version. And I'm, I'm <laughs> don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty <laughs> confident that we'll ship before 14. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, things have, things have slipped before. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I hope we can ship before that. Between 11 and 14. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Well, we're running short on time, so we can try and get through the last ones rapid fire, I guess. Um, when we get to the new UI, do we think we've got any ideas on how that will get rolled out? Will we be able, will people be able to choose between the UIs or will it be a hard, this is the new UI, go with that? 
any of you want to answer because my answer is always long <laughs> i'll try to make it short then uh, but maybe i'm wrong philip i don't know but my impression is that we, there will be a new back office at one point that will be with the new ui and packages would have to 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 be upgraded to fill yeah, we've talked about this yeah. quite a bit because it's like that would be really really awesome if we could just have both back offices running and i mean while we're developing it we still have to use the old back office as well. So we're probably going to keep around, uh, you know, any API changes we make to the back or like back back end endpoint uh, changes that we make. We're probably going to keep them around, keep the old ones around as well. So from a theoretical standpoint, you should be able to run both on the same back back end. But then when we started thinking some more about how that would be in in practice, that would mean that most packages should have both as well because what what else do you do if you go into a, a a node and there's one property editor that's only built with a package that from the new back office and one property editor requires the package from the old back office and then not you can't save it from any of those because they're both required and like there's there's a lot there's lots of really really deep uh, holes you can go into here so <laughs> we we don't know yet it would be super nice if we could support something like that uh, but I would probably go with Nils and say we're probably not gonna. There's, it's probably not gonna be possible, but it is something that we're looking into because it would be super cool. Okay. Uh, will there be? So if you have ideas, if anybody has ideas <laughs> on how we could do that, please reach out. That would be awesome. Well, then that's a good one to lead into the next one. How how <laughs> do we see uh, people being able to contribute both to the to the process and to the to the code? I guess. Yeah. So. Process-wise, uh, as, as I've said, uh, we, we have the RFCs and we will continue to have those. And that's a good place to chime in. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, when we get started on the back office, uh, that's part of the regular, uh, it's going to be a branch on the regular CMS uh, repository that's open source. And we will encourage people to start. Uh, we're probably going to make some kind of announcement once, we, once, we're, once we're kind of on track on where we want to go uh, to, to call for, for help. Uh, and the UI library, I think it's you made it public now, Nils. So where yes. are we at? Yes, the the repository is open, public. Everyone can go view it, clone it, create issues, even create a PR. Uh, <laughs> so so, if you if you like, please go ahead and do it. It's called umbraco.ui, and it's in the Umbraco uh, GitHub. Uh, and yeah, it would be very nice if you try and report issues. And you're also very welcome to do PRs. But for the first five PRs, please keep them relatively small because we need to uh, to grow with this responsibility and learn how we'll do it because we haven't accepted any PRs for the UI library before, of course. Um, <laughs> but but as as the project also um, uh, continues, we, we hope to open up even more, and there will also be a, a announcement when it's. Yeah, there's there's a couple of rough really, edges still on the yeah. on the repository that we want to you know get fixed. Uh, before we, you know, start calling for contributors. But if you're if you're curious or if you want to help out now and you can live with the rough edges, absolutely go go try it out. It's just cloning the repository and doing npm install, and you're good. It's a standalone front end project, and it it works pretty well. Cool. Uh, the last question in the QA section i think there's one from joe gordon which i can't make sense of uh, but, but there's one that's uh will there be a public roadmap for the for the new ui well today we kind of have one roadmap for all of the umbraco projects uh, so we have uh, like a combined roadmap that covers cloud and cms and all of it and i think we will continue with it but we will see uh, UI uh, stuff in there. I think there's one right now that's called the UI library uh, that explains what we're working on and, and all of that stuff. And eventually that will go into done or, or uh, yeah. And there will be a, a new one for, for, for back office. I don't think we, we don't typically have very granular roadmaps. So we're not going to have roadmaps for this component or that component or something like that. But that will be part of the repository. Uh, so in the repository, there's going to be like a list of these are all the components that we intend to make. Uh, so also as, as a contributor, you could pick one and say, I, I'm working on this one. So we don't duplicate all the work and you don't have to come up with what component to work on. So there will be a list of all the components that we intend to do. Excellent. Well, 
personally, I think the new UI is going to be a huge opportunity for Umbraco to to kind of reach out to a, a whole new community. And so I think it's, in, in the grand scheme of things, a real big positive. So as the last question then, maybe you can all say what are you most excited about and looking forward to with the new UI updates? I won't go first. I, I, I've already <laughs> talked too much. So Julia, you can go first. Uh, so I guess for me, I'm the most I'm, I'm most excited about just it getting out to the public because that's my first serious project. So it's got to be an incredible satisfaction for me to people actually start using it and probably pointing out all of the mistakes that, uh, that I made. That's going to be fun. But uh, yeah, well, for me, that's like um, that's 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 a big milestone. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to very, very much. The release day. Niels? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, well, what am I most excited about? I don't know. It's. I think for me, it's about being able to prototype much faster. It's both for us in HQ, but actually, I think mainly deep in my heart, it's for uh, the developers out there. If you need a new pro uh, property editor or changing the, the back office, I really hope we get to a place where it's easily easy to compose a new UIs. Um, yeah, because that's going to be so much nicer for content editors that they get the right buttons with the right uh, yeah illustrations or, or the way to yeah create content yeah <laughs> it's not very specific uh, but but really just being able to prototype and faster getting ui together that 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 will i think that would be a mega world of change yeah and i think mike goes along the lines what you said matt uh, so for me uh, version 7 and the change to to angular js what got me interested uh, in Umbraco. Um, and I hope this next version will, uh, will will do the same thing for for many other people. So it will hopefully open up uh, Umbraco to a broader community of front-end developers and, and yeah, make it interesting. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think for me, uh, it's so nice that finally I can play with Umbraco and it feels uh, like, a, like a modern front-end application. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been dogfooding the UI library on, on one of my uh, hobby, hobby projects uh, and uh, using it uh, and getting all of the IntelliSense support and you know, just writing uh, modern code and, uh, and, and using TypeScript and stuff, all of that in the context of, of something that's from Braco that just feels so good and it's been something I've been wanting for so long. So it's, uh, it's so nice to see that we're, we're getting closer. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to start playing around with it and getting involved with it. So I'm, I'm sure the community will be the same as well. Uh, well, I think that's all we've got time for today anyway. So that was a good timing. Uh, all that's left for me to say is a big thank you to you lovely lot from HQ for taking the time out to answer everybody's questions and to the Umbraco community as well, just to say thanks for putting those questions forward. So until the next one, goodbye from me. And thanks, Matt. You do it great. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.